just in case I lose my way sometime during this talk. I, uh, Bernardo, thanks. Uh, Bernardo and I go way back. We met at least 10 minutes ago. Uh, but I have, uh, fortunately, uh, I do know uh, and been able to uh, say hello to some old friends uh, who uh, I've worked with through my work at either self-help or Latino community credit union. Uh, and it's great to, great to be with you today. And, um, it's a sort of cold, cold week of the North Carolina native, so having the opportunity to come back and uh, talk to folks that are in the asset building field is just a great opportunity for me. And so uh, I'm excited to be here. Um, I won't talk at you for too long. Uh, uh, and I look forward to having some questions and interaction uh, with you. So if you have um, thoughts or questions about uh, how you interact with banks, uh, you know, how, when you think about trying to accomplish your mission, how do you uh, work with banks, how supportive are banks, what kind of partnership opportunities do you have with banks? Uh, I'd love to hear from you on that. Uh, if you have thoughts about how the FDIC can help support your efforts, I'd love to hear about that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I'm supposed to talk for a little bit about uh, what the FDIC does, so I'll, I'll start. I'll start there and talk maybe about a couple of uh, areas of products and services that may be of interest to you. Uh, Noel suggested that I should start off by just telling you a little bit about the FDIC. Uh, not all of you are familiar with the FDIC, what the FDIC does, other than possibly if you go into a bank you might see a sticker that says the FDIC, or you go to a teller counter and you see a little placard that says the FDIC. And uh, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, the FDIC's uh, mission is to promote public confidence in the banking system. Back in 1933, uh, in this country, we had uh, uh, something called the Great Depression, right? where people were lined up to banks, and we had banks failing, uh, and people running to the bank to go get their money before the bank would go out of business. Uh, and uh, President Roosevelt at the time declared a bank holiday to try to stop the run on the bank. And out of that came the idea of the FDIC uh, to create a positive insurance system so that in the event that a bank would fail, you'd be able to get your money back up to a certain limit. In the 80 years since then, not a single, single depositor has lost a penny of an insured deposit. So it's been incredibly successful in preventing bank runs, even this last crisis, uh, other than sort of one, just one uh, brief time where there were people lined up outside uh, one of the banks. But generally speaking, there aren't, uh, when you worry about a financial institution uh, uh, solvency, you don't see consumers, depositors, lining up outside the bank to try to get their money out. I don't know if folks have been paying attention to what's happened in Cyprus and other places. Uh, you know, so bank runs in other parts of the world still happen. Uh, and the United States is relatively unique in having a deposit insurance system that the public has confidence in. Uh, so uh, that's sort of job one. Uh, sometimes I like to say, you know, deposit insurance is the FDIC's middle name, but that never goes over terribly well. Uh, and today is no exception. Um, the second thing that we do at the FDIC that folks may be less familiar with is we are the primary federal supervisor for state chartered banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve. 
what does that mean? That means about 4,500 banks across the country have us as their primary federal regulator. Uh, not Bank of America, not Wells Fargo, conference sponsor. Not PNC, conference sponsor. But a lot of the state chartered banks, the smaller banks, the community banks, um, that uh, probably account for about 14% of the assets in this country, but they are the majority of banks in the country. Um, and we regulate them for both safety and soundness. Are they operating in a prudent fashion, uh, following federal laws, having good underwriting in the products they offer, but also for consumer protection laws. So there are 30 or 40 different consumer protection laws that we are the primary supervisor. We do examinations of those institutions to see if they're complying with federal law, ensure that they have good systems to do that. And uh, obviously, if they make mistakes or errors, um, we're responsible for enforcing those laws. So that's part two. Uh, two other things that we do that I wanted to let you know about um, from an economic inclusion standpoint, uh, we have um, developed over the last 10 years a uh, financial education curriculum called Money Smart. And Money Smart has an array of different products, some targeted to adults, some to young adults. I'll talk maybe a little bit more, and I think James is talking later about a product we have now targeted to small business. Uh, but over the past 10 years, our curriculum, which is free, it's not trademarked. You can customize it to your organization and, and take which modules you think are most beneficial to your community. And um, use that. So far, it's reached over 3 million individuals over those 10 years. And and we do some pretty rigorous testing of the curriculum to make sure that it's effective. We have results that suggest it is. If you can get people to come, uh, it's beneficial. And we continue to work on that. The last thing uh, I'll mention is um, we have a, a variety of efforts related to promoting access to basic banking services. That could be anything from is there a bank branch or bricks and mortar operation in your community or within a reasonable distance? Uh, it also means access to products and services, whether those be loans or transaction accounts. And so today I want to talk about some of those products and some of those efforts and then hopefully take your questions. Uh, the three things I want to focus on first, basic banking services. Uh, the FDIC, uh, every two years, it's now required by law, uh, has uh, what really is the flagship survey of unbanked and underbanked households. Uh, we started this in 2009, updated it in 2011. Uh, and that research identifies that uh, across this country, 8% of the households do not have a bank account. That's 10 million households do not have a bank account. Another 20% on top of that 8% are what we call underbanked, which means they have a bank account, but they also use alternative financial service providers like check cashers, payday lenders, pawn shops, etc. cetera. Uh, and then the rest are what we'd call fully banked, where they get utilize the bank for a full range of services. Now, in the Hispanic community, uh, it will probably not come as much of a surprise to you that those numbers uh, uh, show greater proportion of unbanked and underbanked. The results from our research show that 20% of Hispanic households, one out of five, uh, are underbanked. That's five times the rate for white households. In addition to that, uh, if you are in a household that only speaks Spanish, over a third of those households do not have a bank account. And uh, since I see John and Luis here, I can't help but remember uh, 
far back when I had less gray hair, um, I uh, remember working in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we would read the newspaper. This is in the late 90s uh, when construction was really booming in the uh, uh, home building area in North Carolina in, in Durham. And we would read article after article in the newspaper about uh, Latino uh, uh, individuals getting held up on Friday afternoons after they got paid. Um, walking around with, uh, you know, cash that they were paid for their work that week. And uh, there were a number of instances where people were killed. Um, and having, at the time I was working with Self-Help Credit Union, we thought, gee, you know, there has to be some way that we can help. If we could just set up accounts and get people into the banking system or into a credit union, uh, then, uh, we could really make a difference uh, in the safety for this community. And, uh, you know, it's an interesting time. So we got a group of uh, uh, bankers together, uh, and there were city leaders looking at this problem. And uh, I can now say with 15 years of uh, hindsight, it's really remarkable. Uh, the banks, that we worked with were well-meaning, uh, but they had no contact or interaction with Hispanic or Latino families, their needs, their cultures, their experiences. Uh, and we had in that, I think the initial outcomes was the decision to make from a number of these banks that they were going to print their brochure in Spanish, and that on maybe Thursday or Friday, they might have a Spanish-speaking teller. Um, and that's so far short of what kind of financial services uh, the community needed. Um, so I'm, it's great, it's fantastic to see uh, as a result uh, of, of much hard work uh, with the Latino Community Credit Union. I was just talking to Luis about his 50,000 uh, members uh, now in his credit union that um, you know, started in Durham but has, has really blossomed. And it's really a, a tribute to all the hard work that's gone in. Um, so yes, accounts are important. Savings accounts. Um, I, I guess I should mention on the underbanked, just to finish that story, the number of percentage of Hispanic households that utilize alternative financial services is 28%. So I think if you add those together, about half of Hispanic households are either unbanked or underbanked. Um, savings accounts. Our research shows that about three out of 10 households in the United States do not have a savings account for Hispanic households, that's uh, one out of two. So 50% of Hispanic households do not have a savings account. Um, and uh, that's, if they have an account, they have less money in it. So uh, uh, about a third of Hispanic households have three months worth of, live, of expenses in savings, in their savings accounts to cover an emergency. Uh, for the general population, that's about, about half the families have that, uh, which will come into play a little bit later. So what is the FDIC doing on these things? So we have an advisory uh, committee on economic inclusion that includes thought leaders from around the country, from nonprofits, from government, government leaders, from banks, to think about ways that we can bring uh, more people into the banking system and ensure the banking system better serves the needs of all people in this country. Some of the things that have come out of that, we developed a pilot project to look at model transaction accounts. These are low fee accounts without overdraft, with low minimum balances, uh, in a sort of electronic card-based uh, format to try to get banks to offer new products. We did a 
pilot project with a number of institutions and the findings were striking, which is that low cost, low fee bank accounts marketed to low and moderate income families perform about as well as every other account they have. There's not more fraud in the accounts, which was one of the fear that we had from banks. There's also uh, the marginal cost of adding additional accounts that are electronic, sort of card-based, are uh, insignificant uh, in the aggregate. And also that uh, the accounts don't disappear. That once people have an account, they like keeping one. Uh, and so as a result of that, we've seen an additional number of financial institutions, some national players, some regional players, begin to offer these model safe accounts, uh, but we have a long way to go there. In addition to that, we have a subcommittee that's looking at mobile technology. How many people have a cell phone that has, they can touch things on it? Um, you know, uh, the digital divide when it comes to home internet use is still a pretty significant economic divide there. But if you look at smartphones, you actually find that uh, lower income and minority families are overrepresented in their ownership and usage of smartphones. Now just imagine if we could make that technology give you access to a banking account. That would be, you know, given that one of the main reasons that people don't have a bank account is they say it's not convenient. I don't have access near me. If you could do it over your phone, what is the potential for bringing people into the banking system? So Lauren's telling me I've got five minutes, which means I've got a lot more to go through. Um, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. In addition to all the work that we're doing at the advisory committee, we also have community affairs staff around the country that are engaged in supporting bank ons. Uh, we worked with Bank On California, uh, had one of our community affairs staff detailed to that project for a full year to help launch Bank On California. Uh, one of our advisory council members, Jose Cineros, the treasurer of San Francisco, uh, leads the Bank On San Francisco effort. I think we're working with about 80 Bank Ons across the country. In addition to those, we have alliances for economic inclusion that the FDIC is providing on the ground support for 14 of those local initiatives around the country. Um, let me talk a little bit about home ownership. And I really could talk more than five minutes on home ownership. Uh, home ownership, I've spent a lot of my life working on it because it really offers a, a wealth building strategy for people to become and stay in the middle class in this country so that they can uh, build wealth in their families, which they can then use to send their kids to college, to handle uh, emergency, unexpected emergencies, loss of income, um, and start a small business. You know, normally the wealth disparity between white families and most of the minority families in this country is about 10 to 1. Uh, in the Latino and Hispanic uh, population pre-crisis, I really think Latinos saw home ownership as a tremendous wealth building strategy, maybe the primary wealth building strategy, more so than other demographics. Uh, coming into the crisis, two thirds of Latino wealth was in the form of home ownership, home equity. And the home ownership rate for Hispanics went from 46% to nearly 50% in just the course of seven years. From 2000 to 2007. So when we had the crisis back in 2007, it had a huge impact and a disproportionate impact on Latino families. Um, some of the things that we had, obviously the southwestern states had a more significant home price decline. Latino homeowners overall had home ownership uh, where they, their homes went underwater from they owed more than the home was worth, 28% of Latino homeowners compared to 14%. So you're twice as likely if you're a Latino homeowner to live in a house with 
owing more than the house was worth. Uh, I won't talk about the million foreclosures in Latino communities and the impacts that that have on uh, those neighborhoods, uh, but the really astounding statistic is Latino wealth, Hispanic wealth, the gap has widened. It's now 18 to one, uh, white wealth versus uh, Latino wealth. And it's really remarkable because in the 25 years since the federal government has been keeping this statistic, they've never seen this kind of gap. Uh, which, you know, it's generally pretty consistent, but it's wide. And it's a result of the home ownership issues. Uh, after the crisis, credit scores, everyone knows here, uh, to get a mortgage loan, the credit score went way up. So FHA, which is the a government insured program to help people who can't get access to credit in the private marketplace. So really designed to target low and moderate income families. The average credit score for those loans was over 700 uh, last year. So we really have seen a tightening of, of credit. And for Latino families in particular with thin credit files or uh, 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 documentation issues, that's even harder. We talked earlier about savings. As the down payment requirements have increased, that has a disproportionate impact on families that have lower savings. Uh, I do see glimmers of hope in the housing market that we have seen a rebound in home prices. Uh, we now have some policymakers that are talking about access to credit. Um, last year, uh, Hispanic families made up more than half of the new home ownership growth in this country. And I think the demographic, demographic statistics suggest that um, uh, we're gonna see more of that in the future. And at least the statistical research uh, shows that Latinos still view home ownership favorably. Uh, last thing, and I'll touch on this just really briefly. I mentioned that we're the primary federal supervisor uh, for small banks, most of the community banks. Uh, and so I know a number of you are interested in small business lending. So one thing uh, that's just really an amazing statistic for me. So we supervise about 14% of the banks. Um, these are smaller institutions. They make up 46% of all the small loans to businesses and farms in the country. So just it's, and you may think of uh, these smaller banks and what they do in your communities, but they really are accounting for almost half of the lending to small businesses. Um, Hispanic, uh, I won't go through the statistics on Hispanic small business formation, but I think you all are aware that they are, uh, small business formations growing three times the rate of uh, the general population. We've got a whole bunch of pictures over here, and I was I was looking at them earlier. Uh, you know, bakers and uh, people uh, selling flowers, and and the entrepreneurship spirit uh, for Latino families and individuals. Um, it's not something I need to talk much more about, but I do want to talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing. That we have really identified small business as an important area of our economic inclusion work. Uh, about a third of our community affairs staff around the country are working on small business initiatives in their local communities. And uh, James, who's doing a panel later, which I encourage you to go to, uh, we have developed a money smart curriculum just for small business. And it's not for you know advanced level, it's is for people who are aspiring entrepreneurs, people who do not yet have a small business, but think they have the skills and the dreams and the idea to start one. And how can we sort of provide a bridge working with our partners with small business uh, development centers and others to bring those people and give them opportunities to develop a, a growing, thriving small business. So that's about all I wanted to cover and then save time for questions. 
uh, I do really encourage you to take the opportunity to get to know FDIC staff that are working. We have about 50 or so community fair staff around the country, um, and we have six regional offices that would be probably primary points of contact. But they really, I think, can be helpful for you in facilitating an understanding of uh, how to work with banks effectively and uh, be good partners, hopefully, in your efforts to do what you're doing. Uh, we have a number of trainings that relate to uh, banks' obligations under the Community Reinvestment Act to adequately serve their full community. Uh, and we'll uh, look forward to continuing to working with you.